following is a presentation of Cable 8, Howard Community College. and welcome to On Location. I'm Dawn Barnes. Are you a local history buff? Do you enjoy finding out new and interesting facts about the area you live in? Well, this month we went on location to the Howard County and Maryland Historical Societies to catch a glimpse of the many wonderful treasures they have hidden there. Mary Mannix, who is the library director at the Howard County Historical Society, explains the Historical Society's origins. The Howard County Historical Society was established in 1957. It was the 18th County Historical Society established in Maryland. Historical societies have been set up and established by people throughout the history of the United States. The first was established in 1791 in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Historical Society. The first county historical society in American history was established during the 1820s, again in Massachusetts. A historical society is a group of people who are brought together in a formal organization, in a formal structure, usually some sort of membership structure, in order to either study, preserve, or document certain aspects of history. For example, they may be studying the history of a location, they may be studying the history of a state, of a county, of a small town, they may be studying or be concerned about the history of a structure of some sort that perhaps might be in danger of being demolished, they may be studying the history of a certain group in American history. They may be interested in ethnic groups or a certain religious organization. For example, in downtown Baltimore, there was both a Jewish historical society and the Methodist historical society. How historical societies differ from other cultural heritage institutions is that they usually start as a group of people concerned about a certain aspect with a membership base as compared to some museums or libraries which may be established as part of governmental structure and not be established from a membership base. The society was first formed of approximately 14 individuals, mostly people who were from old Howard County families, and they first met at Keewaden, which was the home of Alda Hopkins Clark. Alda was our first president and is considered our founder. She is the mother of Senator Jim Clark, who many people are familiar with during the late 20th century. As I said, they first met at Keewaden, which was her home, which was located on the top of Columbia Pike, which was a house that was built for her when she married her husband, Judge Jim Clark, and she moved to Ellicott City. The society met there a number of times. They met in other individual people's homes. They met in the Ellicott City Library. They met in the Ellicott City Courthouse. They met in the jury room of the courthouse. Essentially, they went from place to place throughout Ellicott City looking for a permanent location. Then in 1959, the congregation in the building that we're in now, the First Presbyterian Church in Ellicott City, had outgrown the facility, they moved or were building a structure out, a church out in the outskirts of Columbia, or what would become the big town, the community of Columbia, and the building came up for sale. Alda purchased it for the Historical Society in memory of her husband, Judge Jim Clark, who had died shortly before then. She then deeded it over to the Historical Society, and it has remained our headquarters building to the present day. Um, we also have another structure, which is right next door, which is the warehouse, also known as the old schoolhouse, the Weir Building, the old schoolhouse. And it was given to the Historical Society in 1989 by the Howard County government. Um, until 1989, both the museum and the library were located in this one structure. The Howard County Historical Society is the oldest cultural heritage institution in the county. We collect on anything pertaining to Howard County history or culture. The only thing we do not collect on are the communities of Columbia itself. We stopped collecting on that when the Columbia Archives was formed because we have another institution who is an established, stable institution with a professional staff who collect on a topic. We have stopped collecting on that. But that is the only thing pertaining to the history of Howard County which we do not collect. Since we have a museum, we collect three-dimensional objects. Because we have a library, a research library, and in archives, we collect two-dimensional paper items, again, pertaining to anything to the history of Howard County. 
We are the only cultural heritage institution in the county that collects on all aspects of Howard County history. We also collect on the histories of the mill communities, which might be, for example, in Baltimore County or Carroll County, but which are culturally tied to Howard County, such as the community Oella, which is located right across the Baltimore County line, right next to Ellicott City. And actually, Ellicott City itself was first established on the Baltimore County side of the river. So really, we collect on anything pertaining to the history of Howard County. The Historical Society is a wonderful resource for information. Um, the library of the Howard County Historical Society is open two days a week. We're open Tuesday, 12 noon to 8 p.m., and Saturday, 12 noon to 5 p.m. In that very limited amount of time, we, re we service approximately 700 to 800 researchers a year. We have had bigger years where we've had near 1,000 researchers come through, but that is largely when we have very large school groups visiting and due to cuts in funding from regards to buses for school trips. That has cut in the last year, but we average about 750 people a year, which is a large number of people in a very short amount of time. When people come into institutions such as historical societies to do research or research libraries of any sort or archival institutions, it's much different than when they go into a public library situation. Often when you go into a public library situation, you might talk to the reference librarian for a particular question or ask about a certain book but it tends to be more of an independent situation in most cases where you come in, you find the books that you want, you check them out, you go home. In research libraries, it's much more labor intensive where we work with our patrons one-on-one -on -one most of the time. We have a staff of approximately 15 volunteers who run in ages from middle school age up until 88. So we have a good large gap there of people working with our patrons and working with our collections. Most of our researchers, or the largest percentage of our researchers, are genealogists. Local history and genealogy really goes hand in hand. Um, they're just very closely connected. And in most institutions such as this, you will find that most of the patrons, or again, the largest percentage of the patrons, are genealogists. We collect, as I mentioned before, anything pertaining to Howard County history and documentation that deals with the people in the communities of Howard County. So we have a lot of really strong collections which help genealogists a great deal. We have a very strong book collection of approximately 2,000 titles. Over the last three years, we've received two very major gifts from the family of Celia Holland. Um, Mrs. Holland was the major 20th century Howard County historian. And her personal papers are located at the University of Maryland, but we got her book collection. So in regards to secondary sources, we collect not only on Howard County history, but we also collect published material on general Maryland history and the history of all of the counties in the area. And in large part, this is because since such a large percentage of our patrons are genealogists and very few families only live in one little location, that they really do need to also then research and to use other resources as well. So that's why we collect on a very broad issues in regards to secondary sources. In regards to primary sources, we have very strong collections in a variety of different things. We have some governmental records, such as marriage licenses, which are very heavily used by genealogists. We have a very strong collection of mortgages and deeds, which again are utilized by genealogists probably every day. We have a collection of voter registers, which again are used probably by genealogical patrons almost every day they're open. We also have selective service records from World War II, which are really wonderful in regards to not only genealogy, but giving a nice cross-section of a certain population of the county during that time period. Doris Edwards, who is a volunteer at the Historical Society, has used its resources to research her family's history. Probably five or six years ago, I became interested in researching my family and my husband's family history. And uh, since I have relatives who had lived in this area in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, into the present time, um, I came down to the Historical Society Library. I researched marriage licenses, uh, found my grandparents' and great-grandparents' marriage licenses uh, in the files there, um, checked through the um, voters' records, found um, my great-great-grandfather and, grandfa and my great-great-grandfather, uh, both of whom had signed the voters' booklet uh, book, so therefore I found signatures for those people. I didn't know if they were literate or not, whether they read and write, um, and they obviously did. Um, the deeds, uh, there are deeds there to research. Uh, didn't find anything because uh, our people were um, 
renters for the most part, so there, there weren't any deeds, that, that, but they were there to look, uh, to look for. Um, I found information in some of the books that are in the library. Um, there are various books, uh, marriage licenses uh, from other counties. Uh, Montgomery County was one where I found my great-great-grandparents' marriage license listed. So I found a lot of information on my family there. Um, we also collect personal papers. We have archival collections of such institutions as the Howard County Garden Club. Um, we have some personal papers or manuscript collections and archival collections from the United Daughters of the Confederacy. We have a wide variety of different primary and secondary sources. We have a nice, good-sized photograph collection of approximately 3,000 images. That's particularly helpful to our second largest group of patrons who are probably school children. We have students coming in from a wide variety of ages coming. Probably middle school are the youngest, but we have had some elementary school children come in to do very quick projects. Middle school is probably the first age where they really can do some intensive research for their, for their age group. And we've had high school students, we've had doctoral students come in and doing research. So after genealogists, students of any age group are probably our largest resource. Martha Christ is the granddaughter of Alda Hopkins Clark and a volunteer at the Historical Society. Yeah, actually, um, you know, I think the Historical Society is a marvelous organization. It's done a great deal. Um, the library, I think, is a tremendous resource for the county. Um, and, you know, I've, being over there working on the uh, Garden Club archives um, many Tuesdays uh, all last year, uh, I got really enjoyed being there while people came in. People came in from all over the country looking for information on their family history. People came in because they had just, you know, uh, bought a house in a development that had a name that was named after a farm and they were interested in finding out who had lived in that, you know, on that farm and more about it. And, and just a, an interesting st school students coming in with, inf you know, looking for information for reports. So there were a lot of people coming in for a lot of different reasons. And, uh, you know, I'd always uh, enjoyed hearing, you know, what they were looking for. And uh, the, the volunteers at the library are tremendous. They uh, have so much information. Uh, they, in their heads in addition to what they have as a resource there in the library. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's really a, a wonderful thing. And, you know, it's all mostly volunteers, and they do a wonderful job. The Historical Society also hosts a number of events throughout the year. In December, we have our Christmas candlelight tour, or our holiday candlelight tour. And what that is, on one night in usually the first part of December, there's a bus tour which goes to four or five different houses, which the owners have been very gracious in opening up to us. And they tour the different structures. There also usually is a church involved as well. So it's just, there's usually three or four buses running. People go from house to house to church, back to the headquarter building of the Historical Society. Just, it's, it's a standard house tour only with a holiday theme, shall we say. The Historical Society has been doing that for a number, number of years. Besides that, we also have a dinner dance every spring, which is another one of those events which is very integral to the history of the society. When the society was first formed, before the museum was really established, and way before the library was established, the library wasn't established until three or four years after the founding of the Historical Society, they spent a lot of their time having major events, um, such as balls, such as... Um, for example, a tea room was once run out of the basement of the First Presbyterian Church, which was very popular among the attorneys and jurors on, on the Courthouse Hill. So besides the Christmas tour and the dinner dance, we also have lecture series, which occur approximately three or four times a year. They're usually on a Sunday night. They're open not only to our own membership, and we have approximately 550 members, but to the entire community. And we have people coming in lecturing on different historical topics. Also once or twice a year, we try to have an organ concert because we have a very nice, strong organ in this building, which does need some work on it. But from what our organists have told us, is a very nice organ. It's not original to the building. It was built, I believe, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and was brought down probably early 20th century to be put in this structure. So we try to have an organ recital. We would like to do more with that and really make it more of an ongoing series. Um, in regards to our future plans, um, there are many things which we hope to happen in the future. We don't know if it will be in the immediate future or several years down the line, but we would definitely love to get a full-time staff. Right now we have three professional staff members, 
all together they work a total of 40 hours a week, so the three of us kind of equal one full-time person, but we're spread out between the museum and the library. So we would definitely love to have the resources to have a full-time staff. After that, we're really reaching the point where we really need another structure of some sort. The museum building, which is in the First Presbyterian Church, the church is a lovely structure. It's a very cute church. It's a lovely building, but it doesn't make the best museum. We really need better museum space. We need more storage space. If you want to find out more about the Howard County Historical Society, call 410-750-0370 to reach the library and 410-461-1050 to reach the museum. If your interest in local history takes you outside Howard County, check out the Maryland Historical Society. Dennis Fiore is Executive Director of the organization. Uh, the Historical Society and, and uh uh, has been around for since 18, 1844, so you have to figure out how many years that is. I guess 154, 154 years this year. But anyway, the Maryland Historical Society is the oldest continually operating cultural institution in the state of Maryland. And it has a long and very rich history, and it, it followed that sort of um, movement that you saw in other great cities in America. And, and Baltimore, while it may be a, maybe a mid-sized city in terms of American cities, at one point was sort of the Houston of America. Uh, it's where everything was happening in the late um, 18th and early 19th centuries. It was a booming port. There's a tremendous amount of going on here. And if you wanted to make your fortune, you came down from New England or you came from England and you came here to make your fortune in Baltimore. And so in order to be a full-blown community, it needed what was then, I would call New England, more an Athenaeum. It needed a place with thought could be brought out where lecturers could, could lecture, where the big issues of the day could be discussed, and where you could see great art and borrow books and so on and so forth. And so uh, that's really what the Historical Society was, even though here they call it a historical society. It really was the state's library, it was the state's archives, state archives up until sometime in the 30s when the state archives was, was created. It was a natural history museum. We have great natural history material in our collection. It had European paintings as well as American paintings. So it was, a, it was your all-around uh, repository. And really the focus was not so much an American life, uh, Maryland life, but an American life with a, with a, with a sort of a side uh, section dealing with Maryland because we had a Washington room. A lot of historical societies did. They were really seen as repositories for looking at American life as well as, as Maryland life. Um, so it's, it's had a very interesting uh, history, and it's gone through a lot of ups and downs and interesting, interesting periods uh, over, uh, over time. Today, the Historical Society, I think, is probably more vibrant than it's been since its founding. I'm going through a very, very vibrant period, and, and that period is an awareness of the importance of history, how history can uh, inform uh, our decisions about the future, uh, how history can inform our values and help a lot of talk about values can help us set those values. Uh, we're particularly interested not in just glorifying the past of one group of, of elites who founded the society, but really in looking at it as, as a broad-based institution and how we can not only learn from um, the, um, uh, uh, the lives of, uh, of great Marylanders, but how we can look at the lives of a variety of people and the experiences of a variety of individuals. Uh, and, a, and a variety of ethnic groups and minorities, uh, groups that have come through and shaped, uh, shaped Maryland. The basic goal of the Maryland Historical Society is to make people more aware of Maryland's past. Nancy Davis is Deputy Director for Collections and Interpretations. The Historical Society has enormous wealth of objects in many different areas. We have a little over 200,000 plus objects in the collection and they are in many different areas. We have an incredibly um, wonderful silver collection that is one of the largest in the United States, focusing particularly on the 19th century. We have a wonderful painting collection. We have the largest collection of peel portraits, miniatures, and paintings in the United States. We have uh, a wonderful costume collection and a textile collection, needlepoint, needlework, um, embroidery, quilts. And we are going to be um, developing for all of these specialized collections ways for people to see more of what we have. Um, I, I think that people
people don't realize the, the numbers of objects we have. For example, in the furniture collection, well over 2,000 pieces of furniture. Um, and certainly wonderful things like toys and dolls. We are developing a, a whole new wing um, that's where we presently have toys and dolls, but refurbishing that to bring out more of our toys and dolls. We have a wonderful maritime collection with models and paintings and objects that were brought from, with merchants to Baltimore and, and to Maryland. We uh, have an incredible um, collection that focuses even on agriculture that we're looking at very carefully. So there are so many different aspects of our collection that we can do an exhibition or a program related to these pieces very easily. It's, we are just um, so fortunate to have such a breadth of a collection. We asked Ms. Davis how the Historical Society builds educational programs around their collections. We have meetings once a month where we have educators and curators and the PR division and the development division working very closely together and particularly with the library because we see that there's a wonderful crossover between the object collection and the manuscript, prints and photographs division, um, the archival division of this institution. So we see ourselves in a much more cohesive way. And in those meetings once a month, we look at the kinds of objects that are coming in, the kinds of exhibitions we're planning, and together, the library, the educators, and the curators in the gallery department develop programming that really meets and reflects and amplifies the exhibitions and the objects that are coming into the historical society. But I think it's important to say that we're, we're trying to see, and it's very successful, I think, a cohesion between all departments so that you have a, a sense when you come here that you are seeing an object and getting its full amplification interpretively. The Maryland Historical Society's educational program targets many different audiences. In the Historical Society's education program, we develop programs for many different audiences. We develop programs for school groups and students who come to take a tour of the Historical Society. We also develop programs for students who can't come to the Historical Society, and they can be reached in lots of different ways. We have trunk programs, uh, wonderful artifact trunks that go across the state that can be used in classrooms. And we have speakers that go out, actors that go out to the classroom to meet students where they are, because we realize that it's not always easy for students to come here. So we reach students in many different ways. Um, we're developing a program for after-school um, students. They can come here for after-school programs. So for students, we have many programs that appeal to them. The adult programs are numerous. We appeal to those who are interested in the collection, uh, particularly with special lectures that also have attendant curatorial workshops associated with them so that you can, before the lecture, find out a little bit about our collection. And you can have an opportunity to see an object and then hear a little bit about how it relates to a larger topic. We also have a special event in November every year with an antique show, and we have curatorial walkthroughs of the antique show so that visitors have a chance to understand a little bit about what they're seeing. We do special lectures throughout the year that really appeal to an adult audience. The Historical Society's library is a wealth of information. The library is an amazing treasure trove. It's like a huge cavern of material uh, that still is run in a very 19th century way, which is one of our goals to change that. Uh, the library probably has close to 7 million pieces in it. Uh, it's one of the great libraries in America. Our collection overall, by the way, has close to 8 million pieces in it. Uh, but the library has uh, I think something like 4.6 million manuscripts, which range, er, range uh, all the way from the uh, original copy of the Star-Spangled Banner, uh, of course written by Francis Scott Key, 
uh, right through to uh, contemporary business papers of, uh, of Maryland organizations. In between are the Carroll papers uh, of, of the Carroll family, particularly of uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the signer of the, of the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Tillman papers, uh, the, American, uh, the African Colonization Society that moved to, to return uh, African Americans back to uh, Africa, uh, particularly uh, uh, Liberia, uh, Liberia and Monrovia. We have a lot of the documents of that society. Uh, it's a, just a, a tremendous uh, group of manuscripts. Uh, we have the, the Latrobe papers. Latrobe, who built the basilica, was the architect for the basilica here, and, and also uh, was the uh, initial architect for the Capitol in Washington. We have uh, his papers, uh, 8,000 pieces of Latrobe material. Uh, 60,000 rare books and primary research materials, on, mainly on genealogy. Uh, a quarter of a million photographs. We've just begun to catalog those. A quarter of a million photographs on Maryland life. Something like 7,000 uh, prints. Uh, we have uh, probably 11,000 maps uh, in the collection. And so it's a, it's a tremendously rich collection of Maryland-related material uh, in the library. The Maryland Historical Society has approximately 4,200 members. Well, if you become a member, you get to use our facilities for free. You get to use the library for free, where now we charge uh, a daily fee. I think it's 3 or $4 a day. You get to come in uh, and, and uh, visit, uh, visit, depending on what category of membership, uh, you get to come in with your family or as an individual to see our exhibitions. We have a number of events, uh, discounts on all the things that we, that we do. Uh, here at the Society, there's a member and a non-member price. We receive our newsletter four times a year and our program brochures. So you know what's going on here. You have a priority as a member. Uh, and you get our magazine, which is a great bargain. Uh, our magazine is a 30, 40 page magazine of Maryland Life, scholarly magazine on Maryland Life. We're, we're lightening up a bit, making it more narrative and more popular, but it does have um, great articles on, 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 Mar on Maryland life, on, on the history of, of uh, Maryland. And of course you get to support the Historical Society and its ongoing activities. Mr. Piori says that the Historical Society has big plans for the future. We're interested in two major things. One is to overall improve our facilities in order to better, and, and the way we deliver history, in order to better promote Maryland history, tying it back to our mission and our goals. Uh, and we're interested in providing stable base of support make sure that that continues. So we're raising endowment money. We're very dependent on endowment, money set aside and, in a, and invested so that we draw down a conservative amount every year uh, from that, uh, from the income, we can reinvest the rest of the income in order to provide a stable base of support over time. So it's, it's very important for us to do that. To find out more information about the Maryland Historical Society, call 410-685-3750 or check out their website at www.mdhs.org. That's it for this edition of On Location. I'm Dawn Barnes. See you next time.